Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? How y'all doing? Welcome, welcome to my podcast, The Driver Podcast, Dr. Dakman, where we talk about all things your health, coronavirus, as well as diabetes, obesity. And we do it in an educational and informative yet entertaining way. It's called edutainment. We're going to do some edutainment for you guys today uh, through my celebrity friends, actors, actresses, comedians, anyone with an uplifting platform. Today, we have an amazing guest for y'all the founder of Make-A-Wish, one of the creators and co-founders of Make-A-Wish, Mr. Frank Schenkowitz is in the house today. So this man has started something that has helped millions of people. Check this out right now. Comment if you know somebody who's been affected by Make-A-Wish. Comment right now if you know somebody who's been affected by Make-A-Wish, I'll bring your name on screen here for me. And if we do that, let's just hit share so we can get this man all the eyeballs um, that uh, he deserves, very deserving of all of his success and everything he's done to help people with uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. And so do me a favor, hit share, tag somebody, uh, and also tell us where you're calling from, where you're watching from, and that way I can show Frank that he has an international, worldwide audience, right? That'd be amazing. So uh, today is Saturday, April 25th. <laughs> I keep forgetting my days, man. I'm forgetting my days. Coronavirus update for us uh, is slowing down, getting better. Worldwide, we have 2.7 million cases and 180, wait, we have more than that. 191,000 deaths worldwide. Um, and in the United States, I know we have 900,000. Now, let me let this refresh. 900,000 deaths over 900,000 deaths and over uh, 46,000 deaths, 900,000 cases and 46,000 deaths. But we need to stay steadfast. We have a little bit of a bump today or yesterday in the number of cases has gone up a little bit. And remember what, what we're seeing today is what happened two weeks ago. So um, two weeks ago was Easter weekend. And so we have a little bit of uptick in cases because we know some people had to see their family, had to had to do a little Easter egg hunt. But y'all stay safe. We have to stay steadfast. Social distancing works. Um, washing your hand works. Six feet separation works. We know that works, right? So everybody needs to stay safe. I'm in Houston, so my county, Harris County, is starting Monday is going to require everybody to wear masks. I don't agree with that, but that's what it is. So if um, you want to be law-abiding citizens, we have a detective on with us today, Mr. Frank Shankwitz, founder of Make-A-Wish Foundation. So we don't want to get in trouble with him. We want to make sure we wear our masks and stay safe, everybody. So hit the broad, hit the share for me. Let's get a lot of people in here. Let's see. Where are we coming from? Hey, Robbie watching from Virginia. Uh-oh, check it out. Hannah from Katie. Where's my international people? Yasmin Powell from Missouri. All right, uh, 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 San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Maria. Uh, High Desert, California. Hey, Michelle. Oh, check this out. Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, here's a good one. Trinidad and Tobago is in the house. Trinidad and Tobago is in the house. Uh, Eileen Fry from Green Bay is in the house. Florida is in the house. Lawrenceville, Georgia is in the house. Where are my international people? Look at that. North Carolina is in the house. Honolulu is in the house. Never been to Honolulu. I want to do that for sure. Ohio is in the house. Awesome. Las Vegas. Hey, Priscilla. Nice picture. Very good. Long Island, New York. Man, y'all stay safe for sure. Tess from Michigan is in the house. Be good. Akron, Ohio is in the house. Check that out. Oh, I got somebody from the United Kingdom. Michael watching from United Kingdom. That's awesome. Thank you so much. San Domingo. Oh, watch this. Ari, what a funny picture. Check that out, Frank. Finland is watching you. Finland's in the house. Uh, California, awesome. Indiana's in the house. Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach is in the house. Hi, Ivan. How's it going? Oh, here, Heather Yost. Here's your neck of the woods, Frank. Arizona's in the house. Awesome. That's not quite as cool as, uh, as uh, Finland, but that's okay. Oh, Sam is up. Sam is up. Sydney's in the house watching. This is awesome. We have an international audience. 
Tombstones in the house. Great. Hey, Jay, New Jersey. Stay safe, Jay. It's not, it's, it's, it's bad out there. Bahamas, Nassau, Bahamas is in the house. Awesome. Hey, hi, Karen. Massachusetts is on fire. Be careful, Massachusetts. Hey, Patricia. Wimberley's in the house. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. What's up, chow? Be good. Be safe, everybody. Be safe. All right. Comment real quick. If you have anybody who has been affected by um, Make-A-Wish Foundation, right? Today, let me, let me do my intro. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I got to do my intro. Hi, everybody. Dr. Vong here, world-famous bariatric surgeon, author of 13 books. Uh, welcome to the show. This is my podcast, The Driver Podcast. We're here to help you take control of your life and your dreams and your health. And we're going to talk coronavirus and weight loss, obesity, diabetes, everything in between. Uh, we're going to do it through an educational and entertaining format with my guests of uh, celebrities, uh, musicians, artists, and um, other people with uh, uplifting platforms. Today, we have an amazing guest. His name is Frank Shankwitz. He's the founder, co-founder and creator of Make-A-Wish Foundation. He has a book out as well as a new movie called Wishman. Uh, about his life, which I had the fortunate opportunity to be a um, part of. Um, Frank has a long history of military service, in, including the, uh, did I say military? Maybe not the military. We'll talk about it. But he's definitely California, uh, Arizona Highway Patrol, uh, which led him to create uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. He also ended his career as a Arizona detective. So with that, I love to bring on my very good friend, Mr. Frank Shankwitz, and the crowd goes crazy. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Oh, good. And thanks for the invite. And uh, I, I did hire a ten-year-old to show me how to do this uh, streaming, so Streamyard. So we're all set this time. Yeah, we're doing good. You're looking good. <laughs> Yasmin Pyle already says Wishman is a must see movie. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that's excellent. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You've had an, your, your Wishman movie is so interesting because it's a story about your life. And you've had, you had such a great, um, just amazing made for TV movie. I mean, just uh, life. I mean, it's amazing. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, uh, I was born in Chicago at age two. My mother uh, divorced my father, left, uh, and we never knew where she went during a few years. Age two to five, uh, very happy years with my living with my grandparents, my dad on the weekends, aunt, uncles, cousins, picnics, mm. just like family things. Uh, at age five, on a kindergarten playground, a lady grabbed me, said, I'm your mother, and drugged me off the playground and started for the I had no idea who this lady was. And for the next five years, from ages five to ten, was strictly survival, learning mm -hmm. how to survive. Uh, she took me up to northern Michigan. In the summer times, we lived in a tent and a campground uh, mm -hmm. in a car in old, nasty houses during the winter. But just holding that time, learning survival, I'm predominantly by myself. And not so much unusual for other children during that period, but I guess enough so that Hollywood wanted to make this movie. But then at age 10, my father had found us. He was looking for me all those years. Uh, got the local authorities to come out to arrest her so he could take custody, which he had full custody anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that short period, she threw everything we had in an old Jeep. And so we're going to Arizona and uh, started this journey to Arizona, which took six weeks from Michigan because she didn't have enough money. Mm -hmm. uh, we travel a half a day. She'd be out of gas money, no food. Get a job as a waitress, just enough and tips to get to the next town, and sleeping in the car this whole time, just outside of a little town called Sligman, Arizona. Uh, ran out of gas completely, pulled over the side of the road. First time I'd ever seen my mother cry, and uh, she said, "We have no money, no no food, no anything. I don't know what I'm going to do." A rancher stopped. What's going on? She the story. He went and got a gas can, said, "Follow me to the ranch house," and that's where we lived for the next six weeks. A very small house, and our bedroom was on the kitchen floor, and a couple of bedrolls on the kitchen floor. But at least for the first time now, we had some shelter. And this little town was Seligman, 500 people. She got a job as a motel maid. I'm 10 years old. I got a full time working full time as a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. 
I, I liked this little town of Sligman. It was the first time we'd lived in a town. I mean, we'd always been out somewhere way out in the boonies. Um, I'm working one day. I watch a gentleman across the street, a Mexican gentleman, building something. Just out of curiosity, curiosity I go over, hi, what are you doing? He said, what's your name? And I said, Frank. He said, no, from now on, your name is Pancho, meaning Frank in Spanish, which has stuck with me all these years. And he said, grab a camera, kid. Now, I had never had a father figure during this five years from five to 10. I said, I, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what to do. And he started teaching me. He started teaching me how to build things in that. And Juan Delgadillo was his name. In fact, he's featured in our movie, Wishman. Mm -hmm. I became my father figure during this period, became my mentor, started teaching me so many things, taught me work ethic, taught me how to develop character integrity. Because those two, those two characteristics are not inherited. In fact, they are developed throughout your life, character and integrity. Uh, got me involved with sports. I never played any type of sports. Got me involved with music. Just these all these things that a kid would want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started seventh grade, I, I came home one day. In fact, we had got an old travel trailer. It was kind of nasty, but at least it was our shelter. Mm -hmm. And it's being hooked up to a pickup. And I asked my mom, what's going on? She said, I can't afford you anymore. I said, what do you mean? She said, I can't afford you. You're on your own. And I saw my home go down the street. And I went to Juan and I said, I, I don't know what to do. Oh, hold on. Your mom abandoned you when you were... Started seventh grade, yes. Seventh grade, she just left you. Yep. Wow. And, and, and we feature that in the movie also. But uh, Juan said, I know what's going on. He said, and this is now the 50s. And this popular term today, but never then. He said, I want you to learn how to turn negatives to positives. Mm -hmm. That's what he mean, Juan. My home just left. And he said, I know what's going on. I've arranged for you to stay at the widow Sanchez house. Mm -hmm. And she said, charge you $20 a week room and board. He said, the positive is you make $26 a week. And that was a lot of money back then, but every money I've made went to my mother. And he said, now for the first time in your life, you're going to have $6 of your own every week. He said, that's a positive. You're going to have for the first time your own room. You're going to have indoor plumbing. You're the best cook in town. And that's no argument there. Don't have to worry about meals anymore. That's a positive. And that's the first television set ever in Seligman, Arizona. So you get to watch the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> wow. That's a positive too. But again, just, just all those things, learning these things that turn those negatives to positive. He also told me, he said, Frank, when you can give back. And I said, what do you mean give back? I said, I, I don't have anything. He said, you don't have to have money to give back. He said, an example was, in fact, then, Widow Sanchez, look at her front yard. It's full of weeds. Look at her porch. It needs scraped and painted and rebuilt. You know how to do that now. You're old enough to do that because she's mm -hmm. helping you. Again, learn how to get back. You don't have that money. You give your time. And that just stuck with me my whole life. That's really uh, after after uh, when I graduated eighth grade, my mother came up. She said, I need you to move to Prescott, the current town I live now. We're up in the mountains in northern Arizona. <clears throat> I can't afford to live by myself. I need help financially. I need you to come here, go to work full time and help take care of me. Well, and Juan told me, no matter what the relationship with your mother, she is your mother and you will respect her, mm. which, which I did. So move to Prescott. But again, here's these people helping me out. Coaches. I wanted to try out for football. The coach said, OK, he says, you're going to make first string. Then we found out my math skills from transferring schools were not up to standard for me to enter freshman in high school. They wanted to put me back in eighth grade. The coach says, uh-uh, I'm going to work with you all summer. Get that, and you're going to take your tests at the end of the summer and make sure you get what well, he did. <laughs> Again, people just helping out. I always remember that, and I always wanted to do the best, like the Army saying, the best you can be to give back to these people that are helping me. Mm. And that all continues. I, I have a daughter who's 13, and I just can't imagine. And she she just finished eighth grade, and I just can't imagine being abandoned when you're in seventh grade. It's just how how did that affect you? Well, it it obviously is devastating to me or to any kid. But again, I had this people in town. You've heard the expression: "It takes a village to raise a child." Mm -hmm. uh, in the small town of Seligman, um, 500 people. We're always watching out for me, always helping. And I mean, there was very few kids in Sligman my age. Everybody was from some surrounding ranches or Indian reservations. So mm -hmm. there was only what we call maybe 10 or 15 town kids 
from ages real little up through high school. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed this. I enjoyed everybody working, uh, just helping me out. In fact, I was probably happier during this time than I have been with all these years struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then did you go to, you finished school, did you go to college or what happened after you, when you were 18, 19? Uh, after graduating uh, high school, um, I couldn't afford college. There were no such things as student loans back then. And I joined the Air Force. Yeah, okay. I thought, I thought you were in the military. <laughs> joined the Air Force. And again, a great career choice. These uh, sergeants, so on, saw something special. Uh, I eventually uh, signed over in England. And um, when I say something special, my profession in the Air Force was Air Police. Mm. And I started kind of the police career, the interest in it. But they uh, said, we want you to uh, apply for the base honor guard. And there was only three people selected on there. I did apply for that, was accepted. And again, somebody saw something special. But during high school, I really studied World War II history, the European theater, the, uh, the foreign theaters, and really got interested in Sir Winston Churchill, especially during World War II. Uh -huh. and it was an honor for me to be selected that when he passed away to be on his honor guard on his funeral procession. Oh, I mean, wow. Yeah. Uh, we were on the final leg and uh, goes by, the procession goes by, we're at attention. I'm trying not to have this tear coming in my eye. <laughs> but again, just because mentors saw something and helped develop that. So then so then you continue to your career as a Cal as an Arizona Highway Patrolman? No, from uh, after I completed my service in the Air Force, uh, I went to work for Motorola in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. They, they were, this was during the Atlas Missile Development and so on. And they were looking for people with top secret clearances, which I had. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't have the college education. Mm -hmm. Now, this is funny. This is now in the mid-60s. This is the days of the hippie band, sex, drugs, rock and roll, right? And the majority of the college students that passed, yeah, right, hang five. <laughs> or hang ten, I mean. <laughs> Hi, Hawaii. If you're listening to Hawaii, hey. <laughs> but um, the college graduates with engineering degrees couldn't pass a background investigation because of drug use. Mm. And for government contracts, you could not have any of those negative type things. So Motorola were hiring a bunch of us and they sent us to college. We used our GI Bill and mm -hmm. I ended up after a preliminary job in my coaches and high school teachers got a kick out of this as a statistical engineer determining possible failure rates on certain components for the Atlas Missile Program. Mm. And, and Motorola was great. I mean, we, they treated us so good, making more money I'd ever made in my life. I got a car, I got the house, I got everything. And I got very bored. I'm, a, I'm not a big city guy. I mean, it's a great job. But several of my friends had joined Arizona Highway Patrol from high school. And I said, Frank, why don't you apply? I mean, with your engineering background, with your police background in the Air Force. And I said, guys, I'm making one week what you make in a month. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to give that up, that type of lifestyle. But I just started thinking about it. And on a whim, I put in an application. And out of 1,000 applicants, the majority, of the, again, couldn't pass drug tests back then. <laughs> a few of us were selected. I was asked if I would do that. I said, yes, went to the academy, started the career. A great choice on my part, 42 years later, retired. <laughs> so, and then I started. You were a highway patrol, like movie chips. You were on motorcycle, motorcycle cop. Can you tell us about the day where um, you had your accident, Frank? Because that's an amazing story. Well, yeah, and, and I started out as a car officer, and then uh, they started a, Arizona Highway Patrol started a motorcycle unit. It was a 10 man tactical squad. We worked the whole state of Arizona usually in two-man teams, but at the big events uh, like in Easter breaks where the Colorado River on the Arizona border just gets packed with 80,000, 100,000 kids, uh, fatal accidents, rapes, homicides. Anyhow, I'm in a high-speed chase with a drunk driver, 80 miles an hour in a 25 zone, and another drunk driver from right in front of me. We couldn't do what we call our brake and escape maneuver. I hit a broadside in 80. Uh, I was told the crash was spectacular. <laughs> Excuse me. I had broadsided on a motorcycle going 80 miles an hour. And what happened next? I was pronounced dead at the scene. Wow. Uh, my partner tried to revive me. He couldn't do it. He called him a code, what we call 963A. 
uh, officer killed in the line of duty. Now, obviously, we're talking, so there's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. <laughs> but an off-duty emergency room nurse from California stopped at the scene, identified herself, told my partner, I'm going to try and revive him. He said, we've tried. Well, he's no pulse. Well, for the next four minutes, she performed CPR. I mean, you and I are talking, so obviously brought me back to life. But uh, it, it was a pretty traumatic injuries, uh, massive skull fracture, um, brain injuries, uh, broken bones, a lot of missing skin. <clears throat> and it took almost six months to recover from that accident. Wow. So you were pronounced dead and an off-duty nurse was happened to be driving by, revived you, and then you had to recover from all your injuries, right? Yeah, there's, there's always a little humor in these stories, and especially during counseling. The uh, counselor said, uh, now, did Doug, you re go through the tunnel? And I didn't know what he meant. And a lot of people, and you're a doctor, you know that, <clears throat> that when they die, especially in emergency rooms, the light goes out, <clears throat> excuse me, the tunnel closes. And when you're brought back to life, all of a sudden that light comes up like you're going through the tunnel again. Yeah. And I said, well, I do recall. I never thought about it. And she said, um, do you recall your senses coming back? And I said, what do you mean my senses coming back? She said, well, sense of smell, sight. As you're coming back to life, those senses start coming back. And I said, well, yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, I recall a sense of smell, something very sweet, like a perfume. The sense of touch, something is tickling my face, something is on my lips. Uh, the sense of sound, I can hear sirens in the background. I hear my partner yelling, she brought him back, brought him back. The sense of sight, uh, I open my eyes and hear this beautiful blonde with a lip lock on me. <laughs> and if this is happening, I'm happy with her. This is, this is okay. <laughs> So we have to find humor in all of this. That's awesome. But your recovery was tough, right? And it led to some problems with drinking. And can you, can you talk about that? Well, even beforehand, I, I, I'd gone through a divorce. Um, and it wasn't heavy drinking or anything like that. Not this alcohol type thing, but just this kind of depression. Uh, I wasn't really happy at my job anymore. I was also on a fatal team. Uh, they developed a 10-man fatal squad. We were trained, got extensive training all through the United States to investigate the most horrific accidents, uh, the decapitations, the bodies all over the place. And after a couple of years, that just really got to me. Mm -hmm. and, and the apartment, and still today, if you go to your supervisor and say, I need some help, I need counseling, and they say, if you can't take it, you're fired. And it still goes on today, and that's so many years ago. Right. Um, but... When I end of counseling, the counselor said, she said, you know, God spared you for a reason. And every police officer I've ever worked with, um, we believe in a higher being, no matter what it might be. You go to work every day, say a little prayer, allow me to come home, you get hope, and I thank for allowing me to come home. And she said, you have to find God spared you for a reason. It's up to you to find that reason. And two years later, in 1980, I found that reason. Mm -hmm. And what was that reason? I was up in northern Arizona, motorcycle patrol. I get a call from the dispatcher, check out at the telephone. And now uh, this is 1980. There's, people can't believe there's no such thing as cell phones or the internet. There's still a pay phone where you got to dial. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, we have emergency traffic that does not involve your family calling right away. I call, she explains. The Arizona High Patrol commanders have been notified from a U.S. Customs agent named Tom Austin that he has befriended a little boy named Chris, seven years old. Chris, unfortunately, has terminal leukemia. And Chris's heroes are Ponch and John from the television show Chips, which, and people don't know, this is a very popular TV show in the 70s, early 80s. About I was watching it because I had just immigrated to the United States, and I thought it was just so interesting, this, the show Chips. Yeah, and it was about the adventures of two California High Patrol motorcycle officers, Punch and John, Larry Wilcox and Eric Estrada, mm -hmm. the characters. And the kids, the demographic of this thing was from seven years old up until the 20s. The ladies, because of Eric Estrada, seven years old until maybe 80. Yeah. <laughs> you know, his charismatic smile and everything. But they said this little boy said when he grows up, he wants to be a motorcycle officer just like Punch and John on chips. He loves that show. And is there any way before he dies? Now, this little boy only a couple weeks to live. He's in the hospital on IVs. Can he meet a motorcycle officer? And they contacted us because we had originally trained with California Highway Patrol. Our motorcycles were identical. 
our uniforms are almost identical, except ours obviously says Arizona. And our commander said, yes, we will arrange that. And they that's why they called me. They said, we need you to get down to Phoenix. We want you to be the officer that he meets, the motorcycle officer. And it's because I had worked when we're in this tax squad all around Arizona. If we had a little bit of off time, we would go to the grade schools and talk about bicycle safety to the kids, which they could care less about. They wanted to crawl out on motorcycles, but that was fine. It was a great PR. Mm -hmm. I go down to Phoenix and they had time to do so much fun. They had time to work. I'm approaching the landing zone for the helicopter. The uh, state police helicopter, with the permission of his mother and doctors, picked up Chris at his hospital and flew him to our headquarters building. And as I'm approaching the landing zone, the helicopter is coming in. And I all I see is this little face grinning against the glass as they were approaching. Helicopter lands now. I'd never met this little boy. And I expected our paramedics to help him out. Door opens up, little red pig. Pair of red sneakers jumps out, runs over to the motorcycle. Hi, I'm Chris, just grinning and laughing. Can I get on? Well, of course, Chris. Now he had watched ships so much. He said, "Remember, our equipment is identical. This is the siren. Can I turn it on? These are the red lights. These are your flashes. What's in your saddlebag? It's the same as punch." Mm -hmm. Giggling and laughing. I look at his mother, and she's crying. Why is she crying? Then it dawns on me. She has her seven-year-old back. This little boy is having so much fun instead of laying in a hospital bed with IVs in him. And Chris went on that day to become the first and only honor at Harbor Patrol in the history of the Harbor Patrol, complete with his own certificate, uh, a smoke he had that we gave him. But the funny part was we were allowed to take the kids on the ride on our motorcycles in the parking lots in those days. Chris, would you want to go for a ride on a motorcycle? He got very nervous. No, no, I don't. Well, uh, how come? Well, he said, motorcycles don't have doors. <laughs> we, found, we found out doors were very important to Chris. So just then one of the squad cars pulled up, I put him on the sergeant's lap, he's helped driving the squad car around. And what he's doing that, he's chewing bubble gum and just blew this big giant bubble. And I looked at his mother and I said, there's our bubble gum trooper. And she wrote a book, I think it's still available on Amazon today, called The Little Bubble Gum Trooper, about his adventures. Oh, wow. Chris got to go home that night. His doctor who was with him said, I don't understand, his vitals are so good. Let him go home to his comfort zone. Wow. We felt Nicholas again, Frank. He had leukemia. He, he had leukemia mm. and leukemia, and and again, it was diagnosed on a couple of weeks ago. And you have to remember, 1980s leukemia was a death sentence for children. There was no cures for anything. Mm -hmm. We felt good what we did for Chris, and one of the officers said, "We have a new high patrolman, but he needs a uniform." So we went to the uniform shop. They were custom made in those days. Two ladies spent all night making the uniform for Chris. The next day we go out, I get permission to lead several motorcycle officers, several squad cars into his neighborhood to present the uniform. Eight in the morning, red lights and sirens, as you can imagine the neighbors. Mm -hmm. He comes running out, we show him his uniform. He's a quick change artist, comes out, goes in the house, comes out just beaming, just strutting. But he comes over to me and he starts rubbing my wings on my, on my uniform, the motorcycle wings officers wear. And this is the first time I heard this word. He says, I wish I could be a motorcycle officer. Mm. And I just started teasing him. I said, well, Chris, this is the training we go through. And if you only had a motorcycle, we put up traffic cones and we'd test you right now. Now, this little kid's a step ahead of me. Runs in the house and comes riding out on a little battery-operated motorcycle that his mother had got for him in place of a wheelchair. Very serious. He goes through the cones. He comes back. Did I pass? Yes, you did, Chris. When do I get my wings? Mm -hmm. Well, those were custom made from a jeweler. I said, it'll couple, take a couple of days, Chris, but I promise I will get you your wings. Chris got to stay home again that night. I ordered the wings. Two days later, as I picked them up, the dispatcher calls me again, get on a telephone. She says, Chris is in a coma. He's probably not going to survive the day. You're authorized to drive into Phoenix to visit him. Mm -hmm. which I did. When I walked into the hospital room, Chris is in fact in his coma. His mother is next to him. His uniform is hanging right by the bed. Just as I pinned on his wings, he comes out of a coma. Very weak voice. He looks at me. Am I a motorcycle officer now? Yes, you are, Chris. His wish had become true. He gets his uniform. He's rubbing the wings on there. A couple hours later, he passes away. And I would like to think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. Now, our commander called me a couple of days later and said, we just learned that Chris is going to be buried in a little town called Kewanee, Illinois. 
we've lost a fellow officer. I was like, I'm not crying. something out of my eyes. I just want you to know that. I'm not <laughs> crying. <laughs> So we've lost a fellow officer. I would like you and your partner to go back and give him a full police funeral, which we did. Now, again, this is before the days of internet, but the press is picking us up. We're met in Chicago airport by all the major networks, the ABC, NBC, about what this mission is, what we are doing. We get this little town of Kiwani, and again, the TV station out of Des Moines, Iowa, the closest big city, is there to follow this. But the biggest thing is we're met by Illinois State Police, City Police, County Police who have learned of our mission and joined with this full police procession to bury this little boy. In fact, he's buried in uniform as grave marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. Mm. Um, but flying home, I just started thinking, here's a little boy had a wish and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And that's when the idea to make wish foundation was born maybe 36,000 feet over Kansas or somewhere. But wow. just just because one little boy, what that morphed to today. Yeah, and it's something like, um, what, what is it? The average, like uh, a child's make-a-wish is granted one once every 20 minutes or something now? Well, once every 28 minutes, somewhere in the world, a wish is granted. Just like in you and I are to talking today, however, an hour or half hour, an hour, maybe one or two wishes will be granted somewhere in the world. And again, because of this little boy, uh, there are now 45 chapters in foreign countries on five continents. There are 62 chapters in the United States, and they've just gone over a half a million wishes granted. That That's great that we were there, and it's a shame that there are that many children that have that. But the yeah. biggest thing, and especially with your profession, I like to say through the grace of God and modern medicine, more and more children are surviving. We, we changed the mission almost 25 years ago from children with terminal illnesses to children with life-threatening illnesses so we can, we can encounter more children. You know, it's interesting because, you know, the opportunity has to meet the person. And by that, I mean, I'm not sure, and you can tell me, but you had such a hard upbringing and you needed the help of people to help you and mentors and in your career and, and raising you and then you died <laughs> you died on duty and was revived for a reason and then it intersected with this young boy and you have you're you're tall i mean what you're like six two six three something like that right frank yes and six, you're three. light yeah like light skin light haired and light skin so you look like um uh in chips and and you happen to be a motorcycle cop and it just all came together but it wouldn't have happened if you didn't have that tough upbringing and 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 the near-death experience you, you know what i'm saying well and, and there's so many parameters in everybody's life that leads to certain things and i i guess the life of service uh i never thought about that as a child in fact i thought i was going back to work in the grocery industry after the air force i was in training for a system manager when i graduated high school they said your job is still available, but it's just things that happen throughout life. And it depends how you, how you handle those things, I guess. Mm. So do you have any words of wisdom for other people during this coronavirus time that might be struggling, you know, with the isolation, you know, they, they talk about alcoholism going up, suicide rates are going up, domestic abuse is going up. Do you have any words of wisdom right now? Uh, hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> Just too I, no, I, I really don't. I mean, everybody has their own issues, how they deal with things. So I'm so fortunate, as you well know, for the past six years, development of the movie, I've been on the road between making the movie, on the road speaking, and I'm happy to be home right now. I've got so much catch up work to do. Uh, my wife and I every day say, you mean at seven o'clock at night already? Because we're working so hard. We've got a, a lot of property here cleaning up property. We have a lot of heavy snowstorms this past year. We're in the mountains of northern Arizona, mm -hmm. so we get a lot of snow, uh, but just cleaning up the property, repairing fence, and I, I guess the biggest thing is to just stay busy. Now, it's interesting. <clears throat> one of the uh, nonprofit boards that I'm on is called Broadway Hearts, which is based in New York City, and Broadway Hearts, these are a lot of actors, actresses from the Broadway shows, especially the Phantom of the Opera, where I have several friends on that. And they, they go into the children's hospitals in the New York City area, sing, dance, entertain the kids with uh, the Disney type songs and that. Mm -hmm. We were on a virtual board meeting a couple of weeks ago and they said, and 
they're in a city, they live in the apartments. We're so bored, we can't get out, we're getting so depressed. I said, wait a minute, that's your fault. You can look at, you get all your cast members together virtually, put mm -hmm. together a song and dance type thing and ship it over to the hospitals. And then we started this conversation, they're all, mm, and all of a sudden, they're all smiled. What a great idea. These ladies and guys are doing so good right now, three or four times a week streaming into these hospitals. So it's just up to you to find that happy place for yourself. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. How did um, your movie come about? The movie of your life, man. <clears throat> yeah, I, for, and I'm not associated with Make-A-Wish Foundation right now. Um, it gave me an opportunity to get up, develop all these other nonprofits. Um, but I was on a speaking event for Make-A-Wish, a gentleman named Greg Reed, who become a very close in fact, mentor and friend. You know Mr. Reed. Yeah, he's great. Heard, yeah, yeah heard, heard me one time, and he said, how much do you charge for speaking? And I said, well, I don't charge Make-A-Wish. It's my foundation. No, he says, I would like to get you involved on the speaking circuit. And I'm getting ready to retire in three or four years from that point. <clears throat> and I said, well, yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. So I started that. And he developed a documentary he was filming in San Diego called Stickability, based on his secret knock friend that he does. And he asked me to be part of that. And I'm on the stage doing my thing. And at the end, he came up. And I've never been asked this question. He said, Frank, what's your wish? And I said, well, I never thought about that. It's not about me. It's about the kids. He said, no, if you had a wish, what would it be? Do you want a new Lamborghini? Do you want a couple new horses? Do you want an addition to your ranch house? What? And I said, well, I just like my story to be told. So that my kids, my grandkids knew that maybe dad did something cool in his life. And following that presentation, the director, Theo Davies, for that stickability, afterwards came back to me and he said, I've never seen an audience reaction uh, with your presentation and I want to do a movie about your life mm -hmm. and I thought he meant a documentary and I but I initially said no I'm not interested he said yes you are <laughs> and then Greg came up and said I want to be involved I'm going to be a producer and we want to do a feature film about your life and we're going to title a wish man mm -hmm. and I said well okay guys I've been with Hollywood involved with Hollywood before as long as I have a complete script and screen approval we can do this thing and that's why it took Theo Davies as a director and also wrote the original screenplay two and a half years because it was back and forth. You know how Hollywood likes to embellish based on the true story. But we finally came up with what we thought was going to be a great screenplay. And Theo Davies did such a good job on that screenplay and ended up, like I said, being a director on that. And it was a uh, six year project from inception to we finally started filming. And you were there. Yeah. You were there when we were filming. <laughs> yeah, what a wonderful, memorable day, the day we drove from Albuquerque uh, to see you there on, on set in Phoenix. And and uh, it was just so much fun, so memorable. And uh, we got lots of pictures and the baby and everything. And it was a top-notch production. It was really, really good. And super exciting, too. We had a theatrical release there in the Hollywood Theater. So we got to do that, the Egyptian Theater. That was that was fun. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then you guys had some theatrical release uh, across the country. And then um, you guys made it into like Walmart, you know, the DVD distribution. And then you got good news about Netflix. Can you tell people about Netflix? Well, yeah, I'm going to back up a little bit because the theatrical dis uh, distributions, we ended up being qualified for an Academy Award nomination for uh, Best Picture. And what such an honor. We, we knew we weren't going to make that. But what an honor for the cast and crew to be included with the big boys that put this whole production together and all of a sudden be qualified for Academy Award Best Picture. Um, but, yes, we did go on Netflix uh, in January. Uh, Wish Man. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's do a little promotion. Wish Man. <laughs> based, based on the book inspired by the novel Wish Man by yeah. Frank Woods. But uh, it was only supposed to be a six month run on Netflix. But because of the popularity and all the comments on the movie Netflix is getting, they extended it last month to uh, three more years. It's amazing. Which, again, what, what an honor for the people that put this together the cast, crew, everybody else to have the impact. Yeah. So, how, how does that make you feel that you, to know that your story is on the big screen, you know? Well, it's, it's embarrassing, but it's very, <laughs> it is. I mean, 
I, my high school buddies say, oh, come on, you know, you, you weren't that cool in school. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 the the thing, and the biggest thing, uh, Doc, is um, I get messages, and I'm not bragging here, I'm very flattered with this, 20 to 30 messages every day now. I, I mean, this has been going on for a while. What an impact the movie has made on people. Uh, I just got one from South Africa last night. I got one this morning from a retired trooper in New Jersey that uh, got injured in duty, PTSD, and he says, I'm getting my life back together. I saw what happened to you. I could get my life back together, too. Just these comments. And I try, if people take the time to write to me like that, I try and answer everybody. I, I wish I could hire an assistant who would take care of all that. <laughs> it's that personal thing that they're commenting. So, yeah, it's very That's flattering. Really awesome. And can you tell about, so Andrew Steele, who plays you in the movie, and Kim, who plays a nurse, can you tell about them? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Steele, Australian actor. Um, and we were looking for somebody that, because this is a period piece, 1950 to 1980, and the actor that was going to play me had to be, you know, at least six foot two or something like that in there. And uh, good looking, and the problem with Andrew Steele, he wasn't good looking enough, but we still hired him anyhow. <laughs> a funny story on that, I was speaking at an event in Hollywood, and he came up and just started talking about a nonprofit he would like to start. He had just moved from Australia. And uh, when we got talking about he's acting, and I just mentioned about the movie, we were getting ready to start casting. And he got interested, and I said, well, throw your name in the hat, go down on audition, along with several others that he did and got selected for the part. Now, this young man worked so hard. For a year and a half, we worked together on this. Uh, the first thing was to get rid of the Australian accent. <laughs> yeah, and you can't even tell. No, no, and, and he worked again so hard on this. We worked, but he'd forget sometimes it was three in the morning and he'd be calling me, reading a line, and he worked with a dialogue coach. So we had conference calls, uh, tell him how to get that right inflection in the voice and so on. Uh, he had to go uh, learn how to ride motorcycles. We sent him to weapon training. And the kid worked, they spent weeks with me. He came up to Prescott, Arizona, just spent weeks with me. Worked so he had hard. To fire a gun, too, right? Pardon? He had to learn how to fire a gun, too? Yeah, yeah, we had to send him through weapons training. Even with motorcycle training, he got his license over in California, but then we hired a, a retired uh, CHP motorcycle officer to work with him, to teach him police way of riding, a little bit different. No offense to the civilians, but a little <laughs> bit different with police riding. Uh, but then we hired another young lady named Kim Jackson, who she Andrew knew, and she was the played the nurse that revived me in the movie. And all of a sudden, we got a little on-screen romance going between him and her. And now, <laughs> yeah, now it's Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Steele. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so the actor who plays you in the movie ends up um, dating, and then the nurse who revived you uh, on screen, and uh, they just got married last year. So that was really, really cool. Yeah, and and the most fun couple to be around. Kim, yeah. you got one of these people that's uh, sense of humor where you're around her and you're laughing. <laughs> just, yeah. yeah, they're they're a fun group. Um, so that, that's the that. part. If I can, part of the casting, um, we're talking ships, and through Greg Reed, I met Larry Wilcox, who played John Baker in the TV series Ships, and jo and Larry and I became friends. Yeah, and I just contacted him. And I said, you know, we're casting for this. Would you please do a cameo on that? And he looked at the screenplay. I'd love to. And then we're looking for somebody that's going to play my motorcycle sergeant. During this, and we're looking for somebody that had that same personality. And I just started thinking, wait a minute, Robert Pine, who plays Sergeant Gutierrez and Chips, has an identical personality of my real motorcycle sergeant. Contacted Larry, would you please con introduce us? He read the screenplay. He said, I want this. He auditioned for it. What a great selection on that. That gentleman, Robert Pine, so much brought maturity to the set. But you talk about having fun every day with those two guys on the set. So that's really interesting. So the movie about your life, Wish Man, also, which was, you know, started because of the TV show Chips, Larry Wilcox, who plays the blonde headed uh, motorcycle cop, is in the movie. Right. As well as Robert Pine, who played the, the chief in Chips, it, it plays your sergeant. That's right. really cool. Yeah, and, this circle, this whole circle. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that um, Robert Pine is Chris Pine's father. The, exactly. The exactly. And uh, Kitty, my wife, Kitty, was also one of the technical advisors. And she said, now, 
You sure you can't get Chris over here today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was in Scotland filming a movie, so no, we can't do that. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so I tell you, can I throw in another story about one of the people on the set today? Uh, the script supervisor. Uh, I was a technical advisor, consulting, producer, location scout for this whole procedure. And every morning, I'd usually be one of the first on the set, along with the script supervisor, young lady named Kenny De Del Toro. Yeah. And we would look at the set design for the day. We'd look at the uh, script for the day, the costumes, the continuity, everything. So when the regular cast and crew got all there, everything would be set to go. And the third day in, she knew who I know. She knows what the movie's about. Third day in, they come in, good morning, Kennedy. And she's crying. Kennedy, what's wrong? And she comes up and gives me a hug. And I mean, really crying. She said, I'm a wish child. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, people are in there. And now we're all crying. And talk about full circle. Uh, 11 years old, she's lives in Artesia, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, she has this uh, life threatening medical condition. She's too ill. She wanted to go to Hollywood to learn to be an actress, go to acting school. And she's too ill to go. In fact, they thought she wasn't going to survive. She turns 17. She goes into total remission. The chapter says, would you still like your wish? Yes, I would. They send her to acting school. While in acting school, she becomes very interested in the production side of it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of school, one of the directors said, would you like to intern for the summer here in Hollywood? Yes, I would. Uh, all of a sudden, she's studying for a script supervisor. Two days in a row, the regular script supervisor doesn't show up on the set. The director says, she's fired. You're hired. This young lady is all over the world now. This is one of the greatest TV shows, movies, and so on because of her wish. <laughs> and again, full circle. Now I'm working every day with a wish child. It's so awesome. It is. It is. Mark Bold gold with the gut just said, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are wanting to know where they can get your movie. Now, you have a website where they can get an autographed copy, right? So for people who are watching and they want a copy of your book and a copy of your movie, can you tell them about the website? Yeah. The, the movie is available. The regular movie or book, Wish Man book, is available on Amazon. Uh, but if you'd like an autographed copy, you can go to my website, which is wishman1.com, the number one, wishman1.com, and there's a contact information. Or you can just contact me on Facebook. Mm. I'll send a private Facebook message on how to purchase the copy. I know. Your 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 Facebook inbox will blow up if you say that. So yeah, okay. <laughs> this one. You autograph it yourself, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll autograph it. And the price includes shipping. So, oh wow, that's real. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're retired and you're living on your ranch there with your wife Kitty, right? And so this, um, you, you know, you're speak. You, you like to speak. I mean, that's how you really, for your source of income, how to spread the word, all that sort of stuff. You, you'd like to be a speaker. Well, yeah, and I'm so fortunate to have a new career. When I got ready to retire, I looked at the one ends for a retired homicide detective, what's there to do? <laughs> and then it's through Greg Reed, again, this whole new speaking career came about. And I'm boasting here, uh, flattered by it, but boasting. In 2016, I was a Forbes number one keynote speaker. Wow. So, and this, this led me to um, get two honorary doctorate degrees. I gave the commencement address at the Ohio State University. And then also um, St. Norbert College in Green Bay. Uh, and all because of this new speaking career where they invited me to do commencement addresses. And then also all, all these awards, I've never sought them, but I got a table back behind me full of awards. So yeah. it's, it's fun. So if anybody would like to have you as a speaker, maybe in their organization, what's the best way to, for them to get in touch just, with you? Uh, just contact my manager at my website, wishman1.com. Wishman1.com. Because yeah. I think I think a lot of people would love to have you as a speaker and um, share your story. And let me tell you, man, like I'm serious. Like every time I hear Frank talk, guys, like everybody is crying <laughs> in the audience. It's really, it's well, really. Well, and, and I'm one of those, I need my chance to the speakers, but I'm not selling anything on stage. Mm -hmm. That's just the message. And the message is as from the movie, everyone can be a hero. Mm -hmm. How to give back, how to help somebody out. Um, and I, I don't even read books or movies to sell. I just say, if you want some, get to my website. I'm not one of those guys that are doing anything except selling a message. Mm -hmm. That's and right. I'm so fortunate. I'm, on Friday the 13th, the bad luck day, 
I had six events canceled because of the coronavirus. Oh. But since then, they've already been rescheduled, and now we're already booked for events up until 2021. So oh. the, the bad part led to the good part. Yeah. But, the, you know, that's tough, though, with all the, a lot of people don't realize the life of a speaker. You're, you're traveling a lot. You're on planes a lot. You're in hotels a lot. You're away from your property. Does Kitty go with you when you travel or not? It, de it depends on the location and the event. <laughs> <laughs> I got I uh, received my star on the Las Vegas Walk of Fame. Uh -huh. She definitely went on there. And now she wants to. It's a shame Las Vegas is shut down because she likes Las Vegas because she says, we need to go once a month. To make sure it's shined and it's taken care of. So, <laughs> you gotta go once a month. That's yeah. Cool. So, um, so this part I'd like to talk about is the rapid fire question. You ready for it? Well, I don't know if I have rapid fire answers, but we can give it a whirl. So you finished your your career as a detective, and so you investigate murder cases and things like that. Yes. Okay. So let me ask you about the coronavirus real quick. Do you think it was made in a Chinese lab? Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> Do you think it was done deliberately to uh, crush the U.S.? Yes. <laughs> Why? Well, look, look at and, and if you do a lot of research on China and so on and the, the dominance of the world is their goal. But just look, some of the things happened with the USS Roosevelt that was in one of the foreign ports. Huh. Uh, sent there by an actor, secretary of Navy. And then all of a sudden they leave the foreign port and half the crew comes down with it. Now we have a warship, a top warship out of service. Hmm. Look at the economy of the United States. Uh, just things shutting down. People will never, some people will never recover from this. Yeah. And the flu epidemic, I mean, I've lived through flu epidemic. We do every year. More people are killed with just standard flu every year than what's happening right now. Hmm. So, and the hype now i'm not a conspiracist type guy but i'm just looking at facts what's going on our and you've been up to prescott arizona northern arizona mm -hmm. our county itself is bigger than the state of new jersey mm -hmm. yet we only have 230,000 people that live in this county and we have a total of one death and we have 70 people mm -hmm. since it started that if it have and we've only got five hospitalizations and nobody's died on that mm -hmm. But yet the whole area is shut down These, and people are lo they're losing their businesses. Do you think it was worth the economic impact to save lives by shutting down the economy? And again, I think it depends on the location. I've been to New York City and that they're getting hit so hard, uh -huh. but not so much in the city area itself, but in the suburbs, the Brooklyn's and so on like that, where there are kind of the the um, what I want to say, underclass type people living. Mm -hmm. in those bad conditions. Um, I know several people like in New York City, like I said, living in apartments. They don't have any problem at all mm -hmm. in the city. But, and, and again, down in Phoenix area, uh, almost 5 million people. But there's only about 500 registered cases and very few deaths out of that. So do the percentages. Mm -hmm. And then look at the flu virus every year. Mm -hmm. But everybody makes their own opinion, their own thing. When I go into town, I do practice the social distance. I do put on a mask. I do wear gloves. I mean, I'm not going to be a hypocrite about it whatsoever. Mm. Do you, um, without making it political, do you think the government's doing a good job handling this? No. What could be <laughs> no. If you were running it, what would you do differently? <laughs> they just too much hype, just... Um, Again, but that's my opinion. Everybody has their own opinion. Obviously, you're the doctor. You know more than I would it never, ever know about this. But I'm just seeing what's going on with different parts of the country. Look at the Wyoming, the Montanas, and so on. Uh, nothing is really going on up there. Mm -hmm. It is a big city. And if I was doing something, Border Patrol friends uh, last year um, talked about Chinese nationals flying into Canada coming across the border, stop, and they had vials of something. It took a year to find out what the vials were. The vials were, in fact, coronavirus. Really? So you just put two and two together, see what happens. How do you know it was coronavirus? Because the labs checked it. But that happened last year before we even knew about coronavirus. Right. 
Right. I mean, it was happened last year. They just got the results back. It was no big rush thing. What? Yeah. What? And when I say just, it was the end of December and so on. What? I want to have to. We're about to. We're better to wrap this up because we're gonna get shut down here in a second. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna lose our internet. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it just my opinion. Hey, you froze. <laughs> but 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 what what better things to do to take over the economy of the United States than to go to the big cities, New York City? So oh. unfortunate with what's going on. But yet they still pulled out. They still pulled out the uh, hospital ship just recently because they weren't having enough cases. Seattle, Washington. My friends up there. They built the army, built a big, huge tent field hospital. They never wow. used it. They just dismantled it. Do you think this is done so that Bill Gates can sell vaccines? I I have no idea on that. I'm. That's I okay. Mean, I think so. Yes, but again, who knows on that? Especially the microchip. Let's microchip everybody and find out what's going on. If they come up with a coronavirus vaccine, would you take it? No. But you're the highest risk. You're like <laughs> I am. I am high risk. No. You know, I, I will take I will take the flu vaccine. I do every year. I get my pneumonia every what is it four or five years. I don't have to do it anymore. But because I've been doing that, we it was mandatory back in my highway patrol days. Now we're going back forty years ago. We had to take the flu shots because we can't be in the public if we get sick or infect our other people. Mm -hmm. So I know it works. I haven't had flu in 30 years. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus, I don't know. It would have to be proven to me mm. through labs. Okay. <laughs> but that's my personal opinion. It has nothing to do with spreading the word to anybody else. All right. Everybody loves you, Frank. No one cares. <laughs> no one cares that you're wrong. We all love you. <laughs> <laughs> what a fun conversation so what projects are you working on right now um i'm just got contacted by a production company producer they want to do a uh, tv series mm -hmm. uh, me being the host so we're, i can't talk a lot about it we just i just signed a development agreement mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to take up so much time um but then i'm involved with so many nonprofits, like i said helping develop these or they are developed and just promoting them and every day we're, we're doing something with these different nonprofits. And that's my way of giving back. Like I say, I can give back. I don't have a lot of money, but I can give back time. So, mm. and, and we're just so proud of these nonprofits. They're just starting to really rock and roll. Mm. Is there anything in your life that you regret? I'm sorry? Is there anything in your life that you regret doing or not doing? Oh, being a better dad, uh, not being able to hold a first marriage together. I mean, just, we all have, we all have hiccups in our life, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just what you do with them. I mean, not everything is lollipops and rainbows. So <laughs> mm. those negative things that happen, you hope to learn from. You, you ran the Make-A-Wish Foundation for several years when it was in its infancy, and then you turned it over to other people who really knew how to make it grow. Um, do you, would you do that differently? Would you, would, would you have stayed on with Wishman a little bit longer and seen it through longer? Well, I kind of wish I would have because I, I never took a salary, but the current CEO makes over a million a year or so. But <laughs> no, no. When, and, and when you mentioned that, um, when I started this, I'm a police officer and I'm going to boast. I'm an excellent police officer. I've got all sorts of awards during that time, but I have no idea how to run a nonprofit. Uh -huh. And we, our board, after a couple of years, decided, because no one took a salary, and I never got a salary for Make-A-Wish, but we said, we need to start hiring the professionals in the nonprofit world. As you learn in college, surround yourself with people smarter than you. Yeah. And that was probably the best decision the board made at that time. Let's start hiring somebody. And over the years, now we had some uh, princes and frogs during that time, but over <laughs> the years, these people have made it grow to what it is today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get the professionals involved in this, people smarter than you, and let them take over and run it. And, and make a wish. Fortunately, for years, they kept me on what they called the wish ambassador. They would send me all over the country, even as far away as Guam, Penny, and Saipan, uh, for galas, meet and greets uh, to help promote the foundation. I think that's fantastic. Um, I wanted to tell one last story, and then I'll take it up to uh, viewer questions. So to my viewers real quick, if you're enjoying this uh, interview, please hit share for me. Let's get the audience uh, watching this to, to um, numbers up so we can get Frank his his recognition for all he's done with Make-A-Wish and, and his service. 
military service, his police service. I mean, what a man, what a man. So um, my last question to you before we take audience question is this one. Um, can you tell us about your last homicide case that you worked on? Well, I was, I, uh, this is one of, I, I'm proud of all of them because what, at a homicide, what you want to bring is obviously the suspect, but closure for the victim, for the family, whatever it might be. Uh, that, that is our biggest goal, obviously, to get this person off the streets. But I was getting ready to retire, and I was given a cold case with our uh, Prescott Police Department. Um, and back then, they didn't have their own homicide unit, and that's where the state police would come in and, and do investigations for them. But this was a case that happened almost 10 years ago where a woman uh, stabbed her husband to death. And the local authorities at the time didn't have the proper investigation tool to do it, so it went cold case. And they gave it to me and my partners. We had a, a, on our unit an FBI agent, we had a customs agent, we had a uh, officer from uh, San Diego PD, retired all over in this area. And we worked on this for 10 years, and I finally found two years ago the suspect in Indiana and worked with Indiana State Police to locate her. Uh, we brought her back uh, and a long trial, and we finally got her convicted for murder, life in prison. And uh, every year I put a little post on Facebook. Um, I'm glad to see you only have the rest of your life left because such an arrogant woman and proud of the fact that she killed her husband when she got to talk on the confessions. Wow. So, but that's one of those where, I mean, there's so many, but that one just for 10 years working and working and working and kept following up on leads. And it just gives satisfaction plus to the, his family to finally get that closure on that case. Wow. So, how did you trace her to Indiana? Well, I'm giving away secrets now, but because <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like internet. you couldn't just Google it. Like <laughs> no, not quite. We have ways. We have information. We have professional teams all around the United States. In fact, through the world, that keep track of certain people. Uh, if I was like today, I could follow you and do everything you're doing right now, including this broadcast. So what? <laughs> so is there anything is is there no such thing as privacy anymore? Well, yes, there is. And when I just said I could follow you, I would have to have a reason. As a police officer, I just can't go up and say, I'm going to look up Dr. Mom. There has to be a case involved. There has to be what they call the, a DR number, department report number, for any agency. I don't mean from town, city, state. Uh, we just can't go in and Google somebody and find, I'm not Google, but get in a search. In fact, several officers, and I'm going to say, several in our Arizona Highway Patrol or our guys, maybe five in the last 40 years, have saw some cute lady that they saw, they got the license number, they checked the driver's license, get an address and go contact them. Every one of those get immediately terminated because wow. like the check system on there, there's a check system. If you're entering something, if I entered your name, if I was an active police officer, they would want to know why and it would have to be related to a number because you're involved in invest, I'm involved in investigation on you. Wow. Okay. So the check and balance system it works very well, and it happens all over the United States. So there are some bad police officers, or oh, oh, there, there's always that bad apple, uh -huh. always that bad apple. And state agency, city agency, they weed them out. That's why they have their internal affairs or their internal mm -hmm. uh, and weed out those officers because you want those gone. You don't want that bad apple in that barrel ruining the rest of the apple. Uh, lots of areas of your life. Danny MacArthur wants to know, do you do anything with dog rescues? She's my like, wife is on, we both do. My wife is on uh, United Animal Friends, the uh, local chapter up here, uh, rescuing the dogs, the uh, cats, and then get them into adoption. Hmm. That's interesting. And that's another part of giving back to the community, just helping out. All right. Awesome. Um, do you think Carol Baskin killed her husband? <laughs> I don't know who Carol Baskin is. I don't know who Carol Baskin is. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Danny. <laughs> is that the Tiger King show? Or I don't know. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm happy. I'm happy to be out of that homicide section. It took me several years after retiring, especially going to constant. We're talking about professional constant to get what I call the ghost out of my head. Oh, wow. And you see so many bodies in that. You, 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 it, you can't be unaffected by that. 
Mm-hmm. And we we understand that we need the constant. And every now and then I still get some of the ghosts pop up and I've got the local guy here, Doc, I need to talk to you a little bit and talk for an hour or so and say, hey, thanks. Okay, these ghosts are, ghosts are gone again. So mm. That's but, really cool. Well, you know, you've been so generous with your time and, um, you know, just absolutely amazing everything you've done. I, I'd just like to take a, a moment to really honor you for everything you've done in your life. You're such an inspiration. You've helped millions of people um, just surviving your background. Your story is so interesting. Just uh, sticking with Make-A-Wish and, and following your heart and, and look what it's grown into. You are so deserving of all of the success and love and, you know, help that you're going to receive here from my audience. and. And I'm just so honored to call you a friend, Frank, and, and I'd love to give you this opportunity to what one last request. Is there anything we can do for you to help you? What do you need in your life right now that we can help you with? Well, just uh, book sales and, and movie <laughs> sales. I'll watch Wishman on Netflix. Um, and if you're looking for a speaker, I'm a builder speaker hmm. and just going uh, and I'm starting to do a lot of corporate speaking right now on uh, how to advance your brand suggestions on how to possibly advance your brand. Um, but just stay in touch. I'm, I'm so flattered that people contact me. I mean, especially speaking events that people pay to see me speak. And I especially like the meet and greets afterwards because I try and stay as long as I can to answer everybody's questions, photo ops. Again, so flattering. They want to come and see me and hear me talk. So I want to spend time with them also. Such an inspiration. That's why Frank and, and a good guy, all around good guy too. On top of that, and I want to point out that a couple of years ago in San Diego, you threw me my first surprise birthday party, the most magnificent thing we've ever I've ever been involved with. Oh, I still remember that. I said every birthday, I still remember that. Like, hey, it's good, but it's not the Dr. Fong birthday party. <laughs> that was fun. We had the Stetson hat cake. <laughs> It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Andy Steele, who plays you in the movie, brought out his guitar and was playing and serenading you. And we were dancing all night. It was fun. It's good times. Yeah. And, and I think you failed to mention that you're one of the co executive producers for the movie. So I'm a small investor. I'm a small investor. Yeah. But it was my honor for yeah. to do that. With you me. and everybody else have made it happen. Yeah. No, it was fun. Everybody came together to help share your story. All right, buddy. Well, hours up and you've been very generous and I, I'm just so honored to know you Frank I'll see you next time buddy thanks for your right. time. thank you for the invitation again Doc. absolutely bud come on guys give it up for my friend Mr. Frank Shank was founder of Make-A-Wish isn't that amazing what a life story what a you know what an interesting fella I'm going to tell you what you see with Frank is is the real deal. That is how he really is in real life. Just down to earth, um, you know, sit by, sit with you, have a drink uh, and next to a nice fire and just tell stories. Just a great, honest man. And um, we need to really support him and everything he does. So come on, Tribe. I'm, I'm asking you, my, you know, I'm asking you to, to put your you know, collective brains together, reach out to him, uh, get him speaking gigs. If you can invite him to be, to speak at your company, you nominate him to speak at your college or your company corporate event. That'd be amazing. And, um, definitely check out his uh, website, wishmanone.com and, uh, autographed a copy of his book as well as an autograph autograph, uh, copy of his DVD. So that'd be amazing. All right, you guys go enjoy your weekend. Tomorrow, Sunday, I'm going to do a Dr. V COVID-19 um, Q&A. So it'll just be me. And then I've got more special guests coming up. So um, enjoy your weekend, guys. And I'll see you next time. You guys are amazing. You guys are the best tribe ever. Cool. See you next time. Bye.